In October 1919, less than a year after the Great War had finally drawn to a close, bringing to an end more than four years of brutal bloodshed and social conflict, the Daily Express proclaimed that the British nation was dancing mad. London, the newspaper elaborated, is stricken with the craze and so are the great towns throughout the country. The adult population of London at the present time can be roughly divided into three classes, those who are dancing, those who are learning, and those who want to do both. A few months earlier, the Daily Mail, another national newspaper, had similarly commented that dancing was the mania of the moment, further proclaiming that society men and girls dance, business men and girls dance, working girls and men dance, so basically every level of society there, keep that in mind, all have been caught up in the enveloping wave of dancing which is sweeping over the country. Accounts such as these abounded in the months after the end of the First World War, as the euphoric British nation entered into a frenzy of celebration and pleasure seeking cheaply expressed in a craze for dancing. Press items described how businessmen left their offices in the middle of the day for a turn around the dance floor at lunchtime. Women stopped in for a quick dance in the middle of their daily shopping. One article revealed that a London dance studio was providing special classes to instruct war veterans with artificial limbs how to dance on those limbs. And a letter to the editor of another national newspaper uh, expressed annoyance that authorities seem to be prioritizing the building of dance halls over regular trash collection. Philip Richardson, editor of the Dancing Times and one of Britain's leading dance aficionados in the first half of the 20th century, would later recall that following the armistice, Britain was seized by a perfect orgy of dancing. Love that quote. That's something different. <laughs> Much of the press coverage of the dance craze suggested that it was a natural byproduct of the end of a long and devastating war. One London newspaper, upon announcing weekly dances at a local Masonic hall, remarked that we venture to think that never in history has dancing been indulged in to the extent it is this season. Doubtless the reaction after the dreary days of the past five years has something to do with this. Modern scholars have also tended to ascribe the dance craze to the effects of the recent conflict. One literary critic notes that many social pleasures had been stifled in wartime, and she argues that the nation was haunted by a terrible loss and eager to forget it in a frenzy of music and dance. Another scholar calls dancing in this context, quote, a form of celebration, a symptom of trauma, and an expression of longing. So this post-war dance craze has received a lot of attention from contemporary Britons and modern scholars alike. But what I want to talk about this afternoon is the way that the dances that formed the basis of this craze were represented and understood by Britons at the time to be intrinsically modern. So what does it mean to be modern? What characteristics has modernism possessed as an artistic, intellectual, and cultural movement? You heard a lot of different interpretations already today of what this could mean, um, which will give you some indication of the degree to which scholars have debated this. But some have concluded that the best way to understand the modern is simply to examine what people in the past believed it to mean in a given historical moment. Two historians of British history have observed that from the late 19th through to the mid-20th centuries, Britons repeatedly resorted to the semantics of modernity to make sense of the changes in their society. And I would submit that this was no less true of discussions of popular dancing in the 1920s, within which a language of modernity was central. Now, you've probably heard of modern dance, or modernist bodily expression. Generally speaking, we associate that type of dance with concert dance of figures like Isadora Duncan, Martha Graham, in the British case, a woman named Maud Allen. However, lately, scholars and historians and dance studies uh, scholars as well have increasingly been looking at social, or what I call popular dance, as another crit critical manifestation of the modern. As I'll show this afternoon, in the aftermath of the First World War, popular dances were viewed to be expressions of the changing conventions of the age that had produced them. And they were understood by contemporary Britons in terms of the political, social, and cultural changes that the war and the modern age more broadly had introduced. That dancing was viewed to be an expression of modernity is borne out in the first place by the very name that was bestowed upon the group of the most popular dances of the day. They were called modern ballroom dances. For the British, uh, for the British, the primary dances that together constituted modern ballroom dancing were the foxtrot, the one step, the modern waltz, and the tango. Known as standard four, these were the dances that proved to be the most durable following a, a chaotic period of dramatic transformation in popular dancing 
that had actually started even before the war. In the 1910s, the Argentinian tango and American ragtime dances arrived in Britain at virtually the same moment, propelling dancing into a self-consciously modern era. A flurry of dances followed. Notable among them were the so-called animal dances, which included the bunny hug, the monkey will glide, the grizzly bear, the dog trot, and the turkey trot, to name only a few. And as you can see from the images there, each of these was supposed to depict the movements of the animal for which it was named, leading dancers to dramatically flap their elbows in the turkey trot, or outstretch their paws and claws. That's the grizzly bear on the right there, so it literally did have people, you know, pretending to be grizzly bears, um, mostly as a way to, you know, have an excuse to grope each other, as I will talk about in a minute. Um, <laughs> In the wake of the animal dances came the foxtrot, which might have been an animal dance. It is, after all, foxtrot. It has also uh, been associated with the American vaudeville performer Harry Fox, as have, perhaps having been a creator of this. And in fact, many dance scholars have pointed out that um, the name, perhaps, doesn't date uh, to this particular juncture, but as a dance, the foxtrot looks a lot like a dance called the slow drag, uh, which was being performed in African American communities in New York, sort of in the early 20th century before it became so the Foxtrot would eventually become Britain's most popular ballroom dance and would remain so for close to two decades when it was finally supplanted by the quick step, which I won't talk about much today except to say that it tells you something about the impact of the Foxtrot that the dance that ultimately takes it over is just a faster version of the Foxtrot. The quick step is, is a Foxtrot at quicker tempo. The Foxtrot was also the dance that bridged the ragtime era to the even more influential cultural moment when jazz arrived in Britain with the soldiers of the American Expeditionary Forces, as you heard about from Dr. Bristol's presentation this morning. So, in the rudimentary forms, none of these dances had standardized movements, but generally partners maintained close bodily contact. They were cheek to cheek, chest to chest, and hip to hip as they moved across the floor. Particularly in ragtime dancing, improvisation was encouraged, and so, oh, um, and so many dancers inserted dips, kicks, hops, foot stomps and drags, hip shaking, grinding, and spontaneous gestures of various kinds. But as Britain emerged from the war, professional dancing teachers began to attempt to eliminate these movements. They referred to them as freak steps, in favor of a toned down style of standard steps and figures that became known as modern ballroom dancing. I'm going to leave this one up here for a minute, um, just as I carry on uh, for a little bit. This gentleman is Victor Sylvester, who was one of the foremost uh, professional dancers in Britain um, in the first part of the 20th century. He was actually a war veteran himself. The story goes, at least according to his own autobiography, that after he got back from the war, he was enrolled at Sandhurst to get educated and become an officer. Um, but he had to you know, kill, his, kill some time on his summer break. So he decided to become kind of a paid dance partner in a London club because he found he had a talent for all these, these ragtime dances and so forth. Um, and then he eventually quit, went off to Sandhurst, and after a few weeks was like, no, this isn't for me. And he went back to London and became a professional dancer. And over the course of the next, um, well, several decades, he was one of the people that would figure out the standard movements to the modern ballroom dances that I'm going to be talking about. Um, in addition to the fact that he later became a band leader, and in fact was like a TV celebrity by the time he passed away, um, and wrote a series of dance manuals that uh, that I think were put into a number of publications up to like 75 million copies. This dance, this book sold, is still in print. So Richard Sylvester is one of the major professionals in this era, and there he is with his uh, partner Phyllis Clark, with whom he won the World Ballroom Dancing Championship uh, in 1921 and 1922. So there was a specific reason that professionals like Victor Sylvester decided that they needed to intercede um, and standardize the steps of all of these new dances. And that was owing to the strike and objections that were raised against them on both sides of the Atlantic. Many people called the new styles that emerged with syncopated music of ragtime and jazz ridiculous or grotesque or silly. Owing to their closer holds and often suggestive movements, modern ballroom dances often provoked accusations of obscenity, and since many were also associated in the public's mind with African American culture, a racist backlash was also commonplace. In Britain, criticisms of modern dancing also began to advance a commentary that would surround popular dance imports from America and elsewhere, 
for the next uh, you know, three decades, and this is actually the major question that my book addresses, so if you're interested more in this, you know, spring 2017. Um, but to give you a sense of it, the Times said in 1914, with a hundred dances that grew out of the English temperament and the English soil, we toiled wearily around our ballrooms in lumpish imitations of a mode of self-expression that we are not and can never be. Whether we like it or not, we are English. <laughs> Denunciations of this type existed in tension, however, with the rampant enthusiasm for modern ballroom dancing expressed elsewhere. In particular, scholars have argued that modern dancing's celebration of close physical contact provided young women, many of whom were agitating for the vote and other forms of political and social and sexual autonomy, with a mean of, means of self-expression. And in fact, to make claims for independence by dramatically displaying and extending their bodies across public spaces. So that gives you another sense of why they needed to tone these things down, because it was giving women, you know, too much agency in the minds of conservative Britons. In addition, for many Britons, the foreign origins of these dances made them all the more exotic, appealing, and modern. Effectively, all of the reasons that the tango and the ragtime dances were decried by some were the very reasons that they were embraced by others. And as will become apparent over the course of what I start to tell you, there was also a generational divide between youthful foxtrot enthusiasts and older dancers who were nostalgic for the dances of their own early lives. So these tensions between dancing's proponents and critics were put strongly on display in January 1920, when the District Council of a London suburb attempted to ban jazz and all of its attendant dances from the events that were being held at the Municipal Hall on the grounds that they were, quote, morally bad. The move inspired an angry response, however, from the independent promoter who oversaw these dances, and he tried to get out of the contract that he had with the venue owing to this new prohibition of what could be danced. So when this request was refused, he sent local dance enthusiasts who he knew were sympathetic to his position free tickets to the next dance, and they turned up in droves to perform the dances that had been banned, and some of them did so in hobnail boots, so as they, you know, as they danced around the floor, they actually destroyed the floor um, as kind of a way to, you know, stick it to the man, effectively. Meanwhile, the Daily Express, in reporting on the incident, decried this move by the town council in no uncertain terms, saying that if the dissecting glass of suspicion be once applied, Immorality may be found in all sorts of attractive and, as we think, harmless pleasures. This sort of inquest leads to lunacy. Leighton will not achieve a higher virtue by losing its jazz. What I like about this story is that I think it really shows how much contestation and debate there was about modern ballroom dancing as it evolved into Britain's primary popular style. You have government officials, the press, commercial dance providers, professional teachers, and the dancers themselves all entering into negotiations over what the state of, or the future of dancing in the country should be. And sometimes they are in fact debating with their dancing bodies. Especially significant for our purposes today, however, is that ballroom dancing's modernity was often invoked by its proponents and critics alike. For instance, in one Daily Mail article, pointedly entitled, Dances I Dislike, <laughs> the, the author recounted his experience at a recent dance in Birmingham where he lamented the stark transformation to what was being performed in the ballroom since his own dancing days in the 1880s. As he wrote, for a man who used to be fond of dancing to sit and look at the ungraceful contortions of the foxtrot is about as amusing as a devotee of bridge being compelled to watch people playing snap. He decried the vulgarity of American dances in particular and described retiring out of earshot of the jazz-filled ballroom in order to drift back to the perfect dancing and lovely music of 40 years ago. Dreamlike waltzes, the dignified lancers, the jolly, rollicking polkas. And yet, even in condemning jazz and modern ballroom dancing, this author understood that he occupied an increasingly minority opinion, because times were changing. He recounted that he had been declared a dear old crank by his hostess, and letters to the editor of the newspaper in the wake of the article largely endorsed this view. One elderly correspondent remarked, reminded the original author that the dancing of the 1880s was gone forever, like the six cents in cent income tax. Young people want to enjoy themselves in their own way, which naturally in 1926 is different from that of 1886. Another letter from a 40-year-old woman also proclaimed that modern dances were more appropriate to the current time period and in fact were an improvement on the jolly polka and dignified lancer that the original author remembered so fondly. 
Compared with the smooth, cool, easy rhythm of the modern young dancers, she wrote, these bygone performers seem as children gamboling noisily beside their quietly progressing elders. So this conception that the current popular dances best express the modern age was one continually raised after the war. For many commentators, modern ballroom dances such as the Fox Rod of One Step represented a critical rupture with the styles of the past, like the quadrille, the polka, or what was now being called the Victorian waltz. And they collectively became known as old-time dances. The latter were said to belong to a bygone era and were often compared to other relics from the past. In 1922, Dancing Times editor Philip Richardson proclaimed, I am not going to suggest that the modern foxtrot is more beautiful than the old minuet, but it is more in harmony with the times, just as the modern Rolls Royce is more suitable today than the more beautiful Coach and Four of 100 years ago. Another professional dancer used another form of transportation to make a similar comparison between the old and the new. Contrasting modern music and dances to minuets and gavats, she remarked, it would be just as easy to compare the beauty of a sailing ship with the beauty of an Atlantic liner. In these ways, the idea that modern ballroom dancing was more suitable to and an expression of the modern moment was often employed as a specific defense against its critics. One frequent counter-argument to attacks on the new dances was that historically, most new dance styles were poorly received upon their first production. As the Dancing Times observed in 1922, Will those who take delight in belittling our modern dances remember that they are the creations of the age? And will they also remember that hundred years ago, when the waltz was first introduced, folks held up their hands in horror and begged for a return to the minuet and the country dance, just as in all probability a hundred years from now, there will be those who belittle the dance then in vogue and beg for a return to the stately foxtrot of their ancestors. Now keep that quotation in mind, you'll do well of it later. In addition, as part of their defense of the Fox Rod of One Step, proponents of modern ballroom dancing also specifically resisted efforts to resurrect older dancing styles. For instance, in the immediate aftermath of the war, there was a campaign to revive traditional English folk dancing, led by Cecil Sharp, who was director of the English Folk Dances Society, so obviously a proponent, um, but also an open critic of jazz and modern dancing. Yet once again, professionals in the popular press suggested that Sharp's efforts were misguided. In a speech to an arts organization, one professional, professional dancer argued that folk dancing could never be revived because, quote, the spirit of the times has changed. A writer for the Dancing Times similarly declared that the old dances expressed the spirit of the age during which they were performed, but that age is long dead. The new dances express the spirit of the day, and they are therefore suited to and popular with the people of the day. Other observers went even further, suggesting that jazz dancing was the folk dancing of the modern age. The Daily Express made this precise point in 1920 before concluding, the folk dancing in which Mr. Sharp is so interested is the folk dancing of yesterday, and has no place in swift modern life. Now importantly, the claims for modern ballroom dancing's modernity were based not only in its moment of origin, but also in its very movements. Unlike Victorian ballroom dances, which were based on the five turned out positions of the feet, as in ballet, for those of you who remember from your ballet classes, dances like the foxtrot, one step, and modern waltz were supposed to be based on natural walking movements. In fact, a common mantra at the time was that if you can walk, you can dance. Um, and so to give you a sense of what this looks like, I want to show you a little clip, which is from a newsreel from 1920 of the um, amateur uh, foxtrot champions from 1920. Uh, either or Flora Le Breton and Cecil Rubin, um, displaying the foxtrot for uh, a newsreel that would have been played before a movie or something in the cinema. Now, of course, this is 1920, so it's pretty talky, so even though they're dancing, there's no music. Um, but the clip will give you a sense of uh, what they meant by the walking motion of the 1920s foxtrot and how this was supposed to be based on natural movement. And you can see, now there's this long kind of explanation because it's a silent film, right? So they have to explain everything in text. Um, but it gives you a sense of, again, people being instructed on how to draw or to dance appropriately so that they don't um, summon the criticisms of so many. But the dancing is the key part. They're mostly staying 
on the flat of their foot. Their motions are, are not sort of tippy toed they're, um, they're much more based on walking. Now, it still looks complicated to me, uh, but they claimed that this was simple and easy, as we're about to see. But this is a 1920s watch. noting 
A number of people who have not danced for years feel that they would like to commence again, but they are deterred because they cannot do the complicated modern dances. Let me assure readers that modern dances are not complicated, and if they can do the old waltz, they need never dread adventuring into a modern ballroom. At the same time, in another gesture towards democracy, the fervor for modern ballroom dancing was often uh, declared to be a phenomenon that was transcending the class system. One Daily Express headline from um, October 1919 observed that in the midst of the dance craze, all classes were affected by the craze. Another report re uh, remarks that in the city of Leeds, everybody without distinction of class or age is dancing. There were even those who suggested that this shared love of dance promoted social and national unity. As the Express also proclaimed, never before has dancing played the part it now plays as a social equalizer. Never has its influence penetrated to the heart of the people as it has done to the hearts of the British people today. So the love of ballroom dancing was represented as a shared national experience and a stimulant of cross-class unity and thus democracy. Finally, a third prong of this is that not only were the dances accessible, so were the public venues where they could be performed. Um, because this year, uh, the party was an image of the Hammersmith Palais de Danse, um, which was London's first purpose-built dance hall, opened in October 1919, right at the height of the dancing craze. And interestingly enough, prior to this, despite London being this massive world city and cultural capital, there were no public dance halls, at least not ones that were specifically built for dancing. Um, and this made London different from Paris or New York or other kind of world capitals that had, you know, hundreds if not thousands of these things. Um, now, it didn't mean that there weren't places to dance, particularly upper classes had a lot of places to dance. Um, you know, hotel ballrooms, nightclubs, uh, they had specific dancing clubs. The middle classes would dance at sort of, um, you know, town hall type events or events associated with, like, clubs they might be in, like there might be a dance to support your tennis club, those kinds of things. And the working classes tended to dance in, you know, spaces um, attached to pubs or, you know, even in the streets. People certainly danced before 1919, but what you have happening after the war is the building of hundreds of um, purpose-built dance halls that that, that is their sole uh, kind of purpose-built. <laughs> purpose um, and more to the point, they're cheap. It only costs about sort of two shillings. Um, to get into a dance hall, and that price will stay standard, standard for kind of the entire entirety of the interwar period. So it's something that is accessible kind of regardless of class. Um, and you can, you know, anybody can kind of access this, and in fact, the, the working class dance halls like the Hammersmith Palais end up having better facilities for dancing than, say, a Mayfair ballroom does. So as you kind of move further into the interwar period, you have the working and middle classes really directing the future of dancing in the country more so even than the social elite. So in all of these ways, dancing is supposed to be um, accessible and democratic and socially inclusive. So democratic, free, and easy, and unhindered by Victorian regimentation, modern ballroom dances were symbolic and expressive, expressive of a changed world and breakdown of convention, often associated with the end of the war and the modern age. A 1924 article in a dance magazine declared that all I can see in the changes of dances, or change of dances over the centuries, is that they signalize a change in convention. And if the modern dances now show nothing else, they certainly depict a greater freedom of movement. Again, in the greater freedom in British society. This release from restraint and escape from tradition was said also believed to extend to the public spaces where the new dances were performed. Ballrooms, whether they were purpose-built, palais, or um, other, were said to be less formal than they had been before the war, with more of a feeling of fun and gaiety and fewer restrictions on behavior. One writer for the Daily Express observed that not only is the public taste in dancing in a process of evolution, but also the manners and customs related to the arts are changing. It is refreshing to note the atmosphere of freedom and goodwill which permeates our ballrooms. Now gone were pre-war conventions, at least at middle and upper class dances, of you know, formal invitations dance cards, chaperones, all those kind of, you know, um, Edwardian add-ons or sort of etiquette elements to dancing pretty much disappear after the war. So this liberty from protocol in the bathroom and this, in the bathroom, pardon me, ballroom, um, and the sense of freedom expressed through the simple movements of modern ballroom dances was frequently gendered and connected with debates about the status of women after the war. 
Um, you heard this morning in Dr. Lee's presentation that during the First World War, Britain had the Rosie the Riveter moment, largely associated in America with World War II. Women were recruited into industrial war work, into the armed services, into traditionally masculine fields like public transportation and government office work. And they even served in forward military areas as, as you can see on the right side of the slide there, nurses and ambulance drivers. And so having experienced new levels of professional and personal independence during the war, many believed that these women would no longer tolerate the conventions and limitations on behavior that had characterized pre-war society. And this was another idea that was given expression through dancing. As the Daily Mail remarked in 1919, the girl who has been working as a BAD, which was a volunteer nurse, or in a government office, traveling to and fro unattended, does not take kindly to the chaperone-controlled dance. Of the public ballroom, the newspaper similarly reflected that there is a free and easy air about the dances, the result, no doubt, of the emancipation of the young girl, which has been brought about by war conditions. Another dance magazine from this period specifically linked the movements of modern ballroom dancing to women's emancipation proclaiming that the lack of conventional restraint in the dances points to the fact that woman is taking her rightful place in the world. So in the performance of a smooth and simple foxtrot, or in the lively and carefree ballroom, both of these features represented for many a freedom from convention and regulation, and a very modern escape from tradition that was particularly associated with women. And yet not everyone was comfortable with women's emancipation and the upheavals to the gender order that the war had introduced. Historians have shown that on the one hand, women's important contribution to the war effort as workers and sacrificing wives and mothers was acknowledged and rewarded with enfranchisement in 1918. On the other hand, the increased employment opportunities and greater personal freedom that the war had um, created for women was also a subject of considerable social and political concern. This accounts for why, as I mentioned a minute ago, Women were denied the vote through the Representation of the People Act on the same basis as men. Uh, the bottom line was that there was a concern that too many women being given the vote would flood the electorate because there had been so many men killed in the war. Um, you would now have a larger voting pool of women than you did men, and you just can't have that. Um, they therefore dealt with these concerns by denying political rights to young women because it was with young women that there was extra social anxiety in the 1920s. For instance, there was a lot of public discussion about what to do with what they actually called surplus women, who were now unlikely to marry, because if so many men had been killed in the war, there was no way for them all to find husbands and sort of go through what was considered to be the normal life cycle of marriage and motherhood. But for our purposes, what is significant here is that a particular feminine archetype emerged that had strong connections to ongoing debates about dancing. And this was the so-called modern woman. So again, we see that uh, language of modernity. Now, the modern woman, um, you may have guessed from you know, checking out her fashions and so forth, was also sometimes referred to as the flapper, although that was a more American term that the British occasionally adopted. Or tellingly, she was also sometimes just called the dancing girl. Um, and she was characterized by her short hair um, and more revealing, or some believed more boyish fashions because they were boxy and they were believed to kind of um, or to hide the uh, female figure. Um, she, the modern woman or dancing girl was believed to lack sexual inhibition and to be far too interested in drinking, smoking, driving cars, which was still a really shocking thing for a woman to do in the 1920s, but owing to all those ambulance drivers and so forth in World War I, more and more women are getting licensed to drive in the 20s and that still, you know, seem to be a little bit uh, risque. More to the point, she is consumed with the pursuit of pleasure. And in fact, according to this narrative, one of the modern woman's favorite pastimes was modern dancing, which further connected this leisure form to the present or to the present moment and the effects of the war in ways that were celebrated by some and condemned by others. To get at what I mean, I want to spend the last little bit of my talk here telling you about a debate that transpired largely through letters to the editor in the national newspaper, The Daily Express, in February of 1920. It was kicked off by an op-ed entitled The Dream Girl and the Awakening, which was written by the war veteran George Pearson. Describing the wartime experience in his uh, article, Pearson recalled that out in France or under the tropical sun, how often the temporary soldier saw in his cigarette smoke 
the face of a dear, affectionate, typical, home-loving English girl. He would sigh and long for the day when again he could return to the feminine girl at home and satisfy his heart's yearning. Pearson claimed that this dream of finding such an ideal British woman to make his wife after the war was part of what had to help her survive life in the trenches. But he, was, he went on to describe feelings of shock and dismay when he actually returned to Britain to discover that this dream girl of his wartime fantasies no longer existed. Pearson suggested that while men had been sobered by the war, made more serious, and learned the value of hard work, women had generally been changed for the worst. Additionally, in dubbing his embodiment of inferior femininity the dancing girl, Pearson clearly articulated what he believed to be her worst characteristic, which was a fanatical love of dancing. Under the heading, Tired of Dancing, Pearson reflected that prior to the war, dancing had been a pleasant diversion for both men and women, but that the girl of today lives only to dance. She is not happy unless the subject of conversation relates to the ballroom. Is this the type of life that a man wants? Pearson concluded his diatribe by noting that given the immense death toll associated with the war, as I already mentioned, and the shortage of available husbands, this so-called dancing girl was, quote, doomed and would be shelved. Now these statements and the article as a whole created quite a stir. Not surprising, I mean, I get a little mad just even reading it out to you right now. Um, and over the, the next few weeks, a national debate over the current state of British womanhood emerged on the letters page of the Daily Express. Dozens of men and women weighed in on this discussion, and gradually two competing visions of British femininity were articulated. The so-called dream girl, the woman that Pearson had suggested battle-weary men had been fantasizing about throughout four long years of war and would now favor as a wife, was described as virtuous, modest, subdued, and fond of home and family. So basically, the traditional one. Her antithesis was the feminine figure alternately described as jazz man, called the butterfly, or again, the dancing girl. These women were purported to be loud, flirtatious, and lacking in good sense. They dressed provocatively, they smoked and drank alcohol, they drove cars, and they were above all, obsessed with dancing. So they were the modern woman. Now many of the letters to the editor that the Daily Express initially received generally agreed with Pearson's position in this article wholeheartedly. Uh, other men described their own disillusionment with the women they had encountered upon returning to Britain after the war. One veteran, who signed his letter disappointed, wrote that while serving in Egypt, he had also dreamed of the dear girls of home and the, pardon me, the dear girls of home and the purity, brightness, and sweetness of the beautiful English home life. Yet he had found upon his return that instead of the girls of our fond imaginings, we find them a madly given over to dancing type. However, another large volume of mail that the Express received came from women claiming to be the lost dream girl, and they lamented the advantages that their dance-mad sisters seemed to enjoy in attracting the opposite sex. As one woman wrote, it is not the quiet stay-at-home girl who gets the best time, however pretty she may be. It is the one who attends the dancing classes, smokes, and is out for a thorough go-ahead life and the men seem to prefer her. This letter, and others like it, quickly inspired a whole new round of mail to the newspaper from men who were seeking to reassure these stay-at-home girls, and which condemned the dancing girl in even more vociferous terms. As one man asserted, the majority of men much prefer a girl of modest disposition, that is one who does not smoke, flirt, or jazz. Another man similarly commented that no thinking man would ever look for his dream girl in a jazz hall or nightclub. And the position of many male correspondents is perhaps best summed up in a short statement by someone who signed his letter lonely, who simply declared, the best women do not frequent the dance. However, despite this clear antipathy being directed towards dancing girls on the part of veterans and frustrated dream girls, not all of the mail that the Daily Express received endorsed this castigation of the woman who danced. In fact, I argue in my book that much of the significance of this debate resides in its illustration of how contested ideas about women, but also about dancing, actually were in the first years after the war. A letter written by a girl of 19 asked what was so wrong about young women having a little fun prior to marriage, when they would inevitably have to settle down and become serious. <laughs> Other defenders of dancing women turned their wrath on the so-called dream girls, with one writer asserting that the reason these women could not find a husband was because they were desperate and narrow-minded, as demonstrated by their viewing harmless pastimes of pretty clothes as not quite coming both. Less 
less contentiously, other correspondents argued that an enthusiasm for dancing did not necessarily imply frivolity or immorality. Two self-described widows wrote the newspaper together to proclaim that not all girls who frequent the dance hall go because they are of a frivolous turn of mind, but because they, are too, they too are lonely and seeking companionship. Another woman similarly suggested that a desire to dance was not a sign of bad character, but rather that dancing simply provided a necessary outlet for women who were otherwise very serious and hardworking. As she put it, why do your correspondents persistently classify us into two groups, the dancing girl and the quiet stay-at-home? Is there no combination of the two? Many a girl, after she leaves work, has to assist at home to relieve an overworked mother. And yet we still find time to enjoy our youth, go to dances and fling dull care away. Are we to be counted as heartless because of this? This national dialogue continued in the papers of the Daily Express for over a month, serving as a vivid illustration of the social, social upheavals and dramatic challenges to the gender order that existed during the war and its aftermath. But as is hopefully clear, dancing provided a primary lens to which Britons were able to grapple with these changes and many others, in that it, was, it too was a potent and particularly visible expression of modernity. However, as Britain moved further into the interwar period, the modern often fell away from descriptions of modern ballroom dancing. Instead, the new dancing style was incorporated into the national culture to such a degree that it was no longer seen as something which represented a critical rupture with the past, but was rather an established part of everyday life in the region. However, much as the dance professionals who so stridently defended the foxtrot of one step had predicted, the next generation would eventually embrace their own new style of dance which was also frequently subject to many of the same controversies that had swirled around modern ballroom dancing. During World War II, the youth of Britain, now a generation removed from those foxtrotters, became consumed with the American import the jitterbug, which you see there, a dance which was once again attacked for being silly, overtly sexual and obscene, for its associations with African American culture, and ultimately for just being much too modern. Yes, no, that's true. I mean, certainly there is a sense that 
women care more about dancing and are more interested in dancing. I mean, it's a, it's a bit complicated because certainly there is this dance craze and, and I think it is, it's right that it's responding to the war and some of the changes like you know, the shortage of men and so forth that come with the war. But I actually argue in the book that, that some of those scholars that I cited who are sort of saying that, um, you know, that this is a response to the war and it wouldn't have happened otherwise, um, it's, a, it's a little wrong because, well, wrong is a hard word. I, I challenge it a little bit because I actually think that all that stuff that was happening before the war with the ragtime dances, um, with you know, uh, the tango and so forth, has actually started this ball rolling already. Um, and then after the war, when you have sort of the combination of, you know, this sort of euphoric victory um, along with sort of the arrival of jazz, the building of dance halls and so forth, the whole thing really takes off. Um, but, but I think it was there before, and I mean, this is something that we could talk about just about the whole nature of modernism, right? It definitely has specific connections to World War I, um, but it's really getting going before that, as somebody pointed out this morning, in a lot of different ways. And so I think the war accelerates a lot of those trends, um, and that's true for dancing as much as anything, but some of those changes were definitely already in the wind. I have a two-part question. Um, the, the royal family, the British royal family, did they have a, that's not, not necessarily a say, but did they have some input on, on this? And then the second part would be Queen Elizabeth served in the army. Yes. In World War II. She was a she, yeah, she was a mechanic and a truck driver, mm -hmm. which I found, I just learned this, this week, and I was like, wow, you know, she really didn't have to, but, you know, she served her country, and that's just a not, you know. I guess, did, did she go from that to accepting the jitterbug, and, or was she, she seems to be very reserved and very, you know. So. Yeah, so she would have been, my guess is, so Elizabeth was born in, like, 1926, so she, she was still pretty young when all of this was going on. However, her sort of ancestors were definitely tied up in a lot of this. Her uncle, um, who was the Prince of Wales in the 1920s and would later become Edward VIII, the guy who abdicates for the American divorcee, if anyone's seen the Queen's speech, or the King's speech, pardon me, you'll know that story. Um, he was a very enthusiastic dancer, as was his younger brother, the Duke of Kent, who would die, he died in World War II in a plane crash, um, and both of them, were very avid dancers. When the Charleston hits in the mid 20s, it becomes a huge sensation. There's, they're both photo photographed um, Charleston. -y. They're both part of that sort of bright young thing set that you might have heard something about. You know, elite men that are sort of flitting back in the, or flitting out in the middle of the night to these nightclubs. I mean, they're out dancing, sort of carousing until all hours of the night. And so, actually, elite men are a bigger part of this culture than non-elite men because working class men tend to be more reluctant to take the dancing classes and so forth. There's more social expectation that somebody like the future king is going to know how to dance. Whereas if you're like a working class guy in the 20s, you're sort of made fun of if you care too much about learning to dance. And so, so what I would say about that is that, you know, I actually think the royal family is a really good indicator of the, the like, again, the debates over this. Because you will have people that are condemning this sort of decadent culture of pleasure seeking that the royal family is very implicated in. But on the other hand, it's the future king, so it can't be that controversial, you know? So, so you know, it's always this push and pull and back and forth. You have, you know, people condemning it on this side and other people sort of embracing it on this side. Um, and the same goes again when the jitterbug sort of comes around. I don't know that Elizabeth II ever jitterbug, but she certainly <laughs> ballroom danced. Um, and in fact, on her 16th birthday, they uh, created a new dance in her honor, which was, um, you know, played in a number of the uh, London dance halls, which was just, it was more of a party dance, it was a different kind of thing. Um, but they're definitely part of this. And the last thing I can say about that is that both the Duke of Kent and uh, the Prince of Wales were very good friends with uh, Fred Astaire. Because he, before he ever became a stage um, or a film actor, was like a vaudeville performer. Um, and he and his sister were partners, and they performed in the 20s as much in London as they did um, in uh, the U.S., in sort of New York. And so he was already really well known in England. In fact, this goes back to Sarah's question, too. That's another major way that this culture gets spread is through the stage. So music hall, um, you know, uh, dance, like musicals in general sometimes will introduce a new dance. The first place people in London see the tango is like at the theater. Um, and then eventually it kind of makes its way to the public ballroom. So, 
Um, so Fred Astaire was sort of part of the royal set whenever he came to London because he was such a good dancer and they liked that about him, even though he was just a poor boy from Omaha. <laughs> Other questions?